The, these were, for example, it is said that the giant lenticular clouds, extremely organized clouds that look like living beings you see over Mount Shasta, that these are the precipitant electric charge field of a winged dragon. Yeah. And the winged dragon guarding a giant dragon's egg, Humpty Dumpty, at Bucharest is one of these. They're trying to fix their eggs so they can get Humpty Dumpty back, you know. And that egg is, in fact, the ability to reassemble DNA to implosion. And we talked about the physics of how an egg gets charged from gravity and gets a soul, so they're trying to fix Humpty Dumpty's egg, the dragon's egg story. So these are the high dragons. So the high side of the dragon is... Um, becomes the story of Aku versus Draku, Ophanum, the Luciferic, and uh, uh, the winged ones. This, in the local part of this story, becomes Ebi versus Uru. Ebi meaning bird, and Uru meaning snake. You ask the aboriginals who the two brothers were of the ancient gods. It's the bird god and the snake god. And when the bird holds the snake, and so we have a remnant of the bird brain, which needs to be fed by the snake brain, so the bird has to hold the snake by the throat and pump the juice, the, the venom, the testosterone. And when the snake brain feeds the bird brain, Quetzalcoatl returns. A description of Kundalini, basically. So all of this is in the genetic ancestry here that we need to understand the local politics thereof. And the basic story here... And by the way, this, this is kind of the story of wingmakers.com here as well. If you, for those of you who are familiar with a wingmaker, a wingmaker is someone who makes this, wingmakers.com, and the solution in wingmakers is something called, they call BST, which is blank state technology, interactive dynamic time travel. Only that can resist the arrival of the great parasite ETs, right? If we have the right kind of shaman, our gene pool gets an immune system. Well, uh, they think that the interactive dynamic time travel here, which is the only defense we have against great parasite ETs, they think it's an electrical problem, but it's really a psychological problem. A shaman that has the chutzpah, a shaman that has the chutzpah to travel in time, you know, wake up and fix the near future without messing up, screwing up the near past. That's, a, that's called a tron. Or in other words, Quit blaming someone else and, and take responsibility for your own. Offense. Well, but also in this sense, specifically a tron in the sense of metatron or electron. A tron refers to the ability to turn the cross through the speed of light fast enough that in your lucid dream, when you see how to go to the past to fix the future, you can see both at once fast enough so the time cops don't catch you. I mean, so that the event histories, if you meet yourself in the past, and mess with it, then you screw with yourself in the future, and you are screwed. Phase conjugation is how you got there. It's kind of a long story. But anyway, to have the beingness to do that kind of interactive dynamic time travel is a really high-level shaman. Their electric field is time penetrant. These are also called time lords. But the reason they have to fix the fabric of time, like you've got a big bleeding wound in the fabric of time from Montauk, and all these greys come rushing in the parasites, because time isn't fractal enough anymore when they cause it to bleed. And so it sounds complicated, but it's really quite simple. If your DNA was imploding and you're sending a signal through the speed of light, when you go faster than the speed of light, you must inhabit time. You would get here before the Earth got here next year in the rotation of the solar system. That's how you travel in time. Acceleration is time travel. Yeah. And so in the same way that space must be fractal to be inhabitable, also must time. So we're, we're trying to set the context here. We're trying to set the context now that in this culture, um, the, the philosophy of this side, the family, the Draku. Now remember, a seraphim is a high dragon, and a high seraphim has wings, Archon Siakar. And the other side, the family, is specifically known as bird tribe. This is the return of the bird tribe here. E.B., bird tribe, Ophanic, Aku, all synonyms really. In, um, in uh, Iroquois, they're called bird tribe. In uh, Cherokee, they're called Adawi. In uh, Aboriginal Australia, 
In the Adnamatna tribe, they're called Valnapa. An Apa and Apta. And this became the family line, which the Andromedans called Pa Tal. Uh, wings with a tail, which became our word later in Egypt, Pta. These which, two sounds, A, U. That's right, that's right. A, U. And, um, but the PT in here was associated with pterodactyl and winged snake. And uh, <coughs> reptile, the PT, also refers to sept, sevenness. So PT is very profound there, the patal. The Andromedans call this, uh, uh, um, they call this uh, 11th dimensional DNA. That's the way they describe it. In uh, Alex Collier letter from Andromeda.com, which I work with him personally fairly extensively. Um, and so we can see, now we said, look. When the DNA fits, finishes the seventh braid, it becomes 12 axis spin, 5 plus 7. So here the 11th, and they say this is the ancestors of <gasps> Enki, whom we're about to talk about. So this is where we're going with this story, right here. So now in the local politics, where we have a fractal of these wars, the two sons of An, An two, by different mothers, become Enlil, Enki and Enlil. And because this family contained a good fractal of these giant wars, you could breed a vaccine here, see? Now, um, we need to set the local story here for what happened. Here, this... You yes. said two different mothers from Anu. That's exactly where we're going. The mother... The, the, the mother from uh, Enki was Ida, and she was from Rigel in Orion, and she had blue blood. Same name as Akhenaten's wife. Atun, Ida, Akhenaten's wife, thank you. Very nice. Whereas Enlil's mother, by the same father, Anu, was called Urash. Uru Asa, is there a clue there? Right? And the story, the famous story was that, um, I, I want to tell a little more of the background before I tell this part of the story. The, the background is that these two halves of the family, um, they had a different philosophy about how to grow up DNA. In this half of the family, they believed the way to grow up DNA was to prevent it from changing. So on this side of the family, DNA that, that changes is by definition weak. Okay? And that's basically the fallen Draku, at, at least on the fallen side. Now remember, the, a small portion of the seraphim high dragon bloodline, only a small portion of it, had a genetic disaster, which is loss of implosion in DNA, loss of ensoulment, called Nephilim. No phi in them, Nephilim. Okay? So only a small part of the giant dragon family had that genetic disaster, but the rest of the family of the seraphim were heartbroken about the mess. Okay? And so how this genetic disaster happened, the Nephilim, the fall, is a big part of our story. And the Nephilim story is in part this family. So how did this genetic disaster happen? Remember, on this side of the family, they had evolved to a situation where preventing DNA from changing was the agenda. So lack of evolution, lack of mutation. That's right. That to prevent mutation, you kept elaborate genetic records. And the seraphim genetic records are called the Mormon tablets, for example. And this is a culture designed to prevent DNA from morphing, basically. So basically it's extreme inbreeding, which... That's reptilian, yes. And so, and, but another aspect of that was that this reptilian DNA he brought was recessive. It had to be inbred, so that both fits here. So we want to understand first what was the philosophy of the two halves of the family. On this side, if you plant a forest, your reason for a plant of, to planting a forest was to plan to cut it down. On this side of the family, if you plant a forest, your reason for planting the DNA was to plan to set it free in order to learn from it. Now, I'm oversimplifying here, but that's basically a difference in philosophy. Yeah? It's a farmer's philosophy. Yeah. So here, the harvest procedure is quite different. But it's also right brain and left brain. 
in a way it's many things. And remember, this is an overgeneralization and this is an archetype. And we're not here to insult anybody, but we're trying to understand the history. Yeah. So on these sides of the family, this side of the family began to, well, actually, the story is that the galactic core cultures planted the Draku in the Orion sector because it was a long way from downtown. No. Uh, uh, actually, well, yeah, really, not that, it, not that it was, not that it was a bad place. Actually, it was just such a place that required a fierceness in order to survive. In fact, you know, the family later asked, "Well, why did you put the Draku here in our Orion sector? We don't like them." And the galactic core culture said, "Look." The Orion sector was such a tough place to settle that you needed fierce survival instincts. And the Draku had fierce survival instincts. So they had a reason for putting the Draku in the Orion sector. Well, <clears throat> uh, anyway, the local history was then that they began, and this story is told in, I'm running out of space on this board here, in, <laughs> in, in the uh, 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 book, Guardians of the Grail by Robert Morningsky. Guardians of the Grail. Okay. And Mor Morningsky is reporting on the Hopi history he, they learned from the ETs. And they're reporting on the evolution of the Asa Uru. The feared and dreaded Asa Uru. Right? Um, and what he's saying here is that the um, the Draku line had conquered, using later fear and terror, most of the inhabitable planetoids of the Orion sector. And the only culture that they encountered which could resist them was called uh, the Bird Dog, which became Dogon, which became Weolawa. And the bird dog culture is basically this culture. And on two, here on Sirius A, has a piece of the bird dog culture. This is the, the contrast uh, bird tribe versus the, 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 the dog, the, the, repti the reptile tribe. And um, so a treaty was set forward that could end these Orion Wars. Because by that time, they had killed the Lyran civilization, if you read Prism of Lyra which had millions of humanoids that died the day they blew up the whole Lyran star system. And the women on Lyra who had red hair were valued because the extra iron solubility made psychokinesis. And this became the story of the witches, and there's lots of pieces of that puzzle. So we have some smiles back there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, it, in, so the day the, the Lyran civilization was blown up here, uh, it was realized that a truce was needed in the Orion Wars, and that truce involved that the bird dog kings would accept in marriage an assigned telepathic Orion queen, Asa Uru, Reverend Mother, <laughs> who would report telepathically back to the ruling culture on the activities of the bird dog king. So now, if you see the role of Reverend Mothers in Dune, and Dune has more accurate history than the Bible, Honestly, it's true. Um, so uh, the, the bird dog king, uh, in this case Anu, had to accept a marriage with a hive mind telepathic queen, Ida. Uh, 